Hey everybody, welcome to video three on a video series focused on the Ample Reserve Policy Framework. That's right, the Fed's Ample Reserve Policy Framework. The Fed now implements monetary policy under what they call an Ample Reserve Framework. They've been doing so since 2008. Prior to 2008, they implemented monetary policy following a limited reserve policy framework. Now, in video one of this video series, I really explained the background of that, so I would very much invite you to watch that. But I am going to review it a little bit here in this video three. Okay, In this video three, we are trying to understand this curve, the all-important demand for reserves curve. Okay, This curve is banks' demand to hold reserves at the Fed, to hold reserve balances at the Fed. Watch video one and two to really understand what reserves are. The key thing I want you to understand in this video, one key thing, is this curve is not very important, and I'm really going to focus on this flat portion right here, this bottom flat portion of the demand reserve curve. But I do want to do a little bit of housekeeping before I get there, okay? Number one, why is this curve no longer important? Because this is a conceptual drawing really limited by the space I have in this video. If I was to draw this demand for reserve curves correctly, I would have, this would right, be right here, being right next to me, this little space there, I'd have this steep decline right there, right next to me, but then this portion of the curve would extend out 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 feet to the right, okay? Literally, that's what I want you to get in your head, is this curve being way off to the right, Right. And this red supply of reserves curve intersecting the up for reserves curve way over there. That's right, this steep portion being right next to me like it is, with this curve going way out there. That gives you an idea of the ample reserve policy framework. Really, they kind of are implementing under an abundant or even super abundant uh, reserve policy framework right now, okay? Because that's how far that model is, or how far this graph extends to the right. Here's the deal. Because of that, this supply of reserve curves is not important at all. Now, how would the Fed change the supply of reserves? The, res the supply of reserves or the amount of reserve balances banks held, okay, this supply right here. They would do, through, do so through open market operations. That used to be the number one policy tool of the Fed to change the federal funds rate. They would do open market purchases, which would increase reserve balances of banks, or they do open market sales, which would decrease the supply of reserves. And you can imagine if we were under a limited reserve policy framework, right over here, the steep portion of the curve, okay, if I brought this over and I started shifting that curve, oh, hey, it has a big effect on the federal funds rate. And so open market operations would still be the key tool, but it is only the key tool if we're under a limited reserve policy framework. Under an ample reserve framework, you've got that visual in your head, shifting this curve left and right doesn't do anything to the federal funds rate. So it's not an important curve anymore. So the whole goal now, okay, for us, teachers and students of the ample reserve policy framework is really to understand this curve. It is the key curve. And understand, yes, there is a supply curve and it's intersecting this curve way off to the right, and that's the concept of ample reserves. Now, I've even done something on my graph, put a couple dash marks and dash marks and say, hey, there's a break here, okay? And I'm skipping hundreds of billions of dollars, okay, in this little break here, and then, then you can see I'm way off to the right. So hopefully that makes sense. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this top portion because I do so in video two. I just want you to know, hey, why does this demand for reserve curves not just continue to go up, maybe kind of not intercept the vertical axis, but to continue to go up with the federal funds rate? Because the Fed has a discount rate, okay, which is the interest rate the Fed charges banks to borrow reserves, and they set that about a half a percentage point above the federal funds rate, which is down here, okay, which I'll draw in in just a second. And so what that discount rate does is it effectively puts a ceiling on the federal funds rate. Now, just to make sure we've got that, even though this is not that important, banks are not going to go to the federal funds market and borrow reserves from other banks, because that's what happens in federal, federal funds market, interbank lending. They're not going to go to that market and borrow reserves from other banks and pay a federal funds rate that is higher than the discount rate when they can go to the Fed and borrow reserves there. Hence, the discount rate gives us a ceiling. But again, not all that important. What is important is this flat portion because again, that's where the supply of reserves curve is intersecting demand for reserves and that's what's going to give us our federal fund rate. So the question is, 
why or what gives us this flat portion of the curve? And the, the answer is their new number one policy tool, which is the interest rate on reserve balances, okay? That interest rate on reserve balances performs a couple of functions to determine the federal funds rate, okay? So this is now our key policy tool. What are these two functions? Well, one is termed, it's a reservation rate. That's actually the concept that gives us the fact that it is a floor, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and put floor, and I want you to associate that with this concept of reservation rate. And basically what that is saying is, hey, banks would never go to the federal funds market and lend reserves in the federal funds rate uh, market at a federal funds rate, right, at a federal funds rate that is below the interest rate that they would be paid on their reserve balances, because that's what the interest rate on reserve balances is. It's the interest rate the Fed pays banks for holding reserve balances at the Fed, okay? So that interest rate on reserve balances performs this concept of a reservation rate. And that reservation rate, when you hear that term, I want you to think, oh, that makes that gives us the floor. And again, the reason it is a floor is, hey, that federal funds rate will never go below it. Why will it not go below it? Because banks will never lend reserves at a federal funds rate, right? Never at a federal funds rate that is lower than the interest rate that they can earn on their reserve balances at the Fed. Boom, there you go. Now we've got the floor. Now, that reservation rate, I think, is really kind of important because in some ways, I feel like you can kind of end it right there. You've got your floor, you've got your ceiling. We know the supply curve is far off to the right, and so, hey, that supply curve intersects the demand curve, you know, somewhere far off to the right, and so that IORD's got to give us our federal funds rate. And for the most part, you're kind of there. But there is Another question, why doesn't the federal funds rate maybe hover in between these two? Why does it really gravitate to the interest rate on reserve balances? And to understand that, you have to understand the, uh, the concept of arbitrage. Okay, so here, bear with me. It's one of the reasons I got rid of the supply curve. All right, and this is actually not going to be hard at all. So I'm going to put Fed, okay? Now remember, the Fed is where banks hold their reserve balances, right? That's where we hold our reserve balances. And then there's this federal funds market, okay? Again, that's an interbank lending market, interbank lending market, right? Banks lend reserves to each other. Banks are both the supplier and the demander of reserves, okay? Now, the Fed, if you hold your reserve balances there, you're going to get paid a interest rate on reserve balances. That's what we've been talking about, okay? So I'm going to say the interest rate on reserve balances is going to be 0.5% right now. Now, imagine a situation that the federal funds rate was higher than this, okay? So let's say we had a federal funds rate, that's the interest rate determined in the federal funds market, and it was 0.75%. Well, what would we see in this particular case? Well, banks would withdraw their reserve balances from the Fed and supply, right? They would supply those funds over here to the federal funds market. Well, when they supply those funds to the federal funds market, right, an increase in supply of funds in the federal funds market, the federal funds rate would start coming down until it got to the interest rate on reserve balances. Remember, going over this concept of arbitrage. Now, next, how about if that federal funds rate was below 0.25. Well, we've already said it should not do that, right? We kind of don't need to do this because we've talked about that reservation rate concept. The federal funds rate should never be below the interest rate on reserve balances. But just to kind of finish this other concept known as arbitrage and make sure that we've got it, what would happen in this particular case? Well, banks would go to the federal funds market and borrow reserves at what? 0.25%, right? And they would take those reserves to the Fed so that they could earn 5%, another arbitrage opportunity. So in this particular case, if it was down here, they would borrow. Well, what does borrowing reserves look like? That's an increase in demand for reserves. If you get an increase in demand for anything, the price of that thing goes up. That would drive the federal funds rate up. And so this concept of arbitrage is going to make it so that the interest rate on reserve balances is going to equal the federal fund rate, okay? So between the concept of reservation 
in arbitrage, this new thing, the interest rate on reserve balances, or at least new policy tool, it's the new number one policy tool of the Fed to establish the federal funds rate. Remember, this rate is going to move. Why is it going to move? It's a market-based rate, so it's going to change with supply and demand. That's what I described. This rate is an administered rate. It's set by the Fed, so it's not going to move. It's not a market-based rate. And so that's why what I just described is going to force that federal funds rate to converge on the interest rate on reserve balances. And there you got it. The new number one policy tool for determining the federal funds rate under the ample reserve policy framework. Now, there is a couple more videos I'm gonna do to explain a few nuances of this whole thing. But this video three, if you watched one, two, and three, you're pretty much there. You've got the policy framework. Everything else is just a couple of nuances that we've gotta talk about if you really wanna get into the weeds on this. Anyhow, thanks for tuning in. Maybe we'll see you in some of those extra videos.